This is um, <clears throat> a lesson on color correction and sensitometry in a dark room. And I had never planned to make a video lesson on this because um, it's fairly complicated. And it really is not for everybody. But um, during the course of the last year and a half when I was making my videos on black and white, <clears throat> I watched a lot of YouTube videos on photography. And none of them cover this area. Um, talking about color correction and how to use a densitometer and data from a standard negative in a color dark room. <clears throat> and It's not something that um, should be left in the dark, um, seeing as how there are so many young photographers getting into film now and also getting into color. Um, I thought I would put this out on YouTube and so it would be there. Now, um, when I initially thought of doing these lessons, it was mainly to teach film masking, which is unknown to most people. But in order to understand film masking, I had to go back and, and teach how paper responds to exposure and how to expose prop film properly. So that's why those first two areas were covered before I ventured into film masking. And film masking was like, a card up my sleeve that I would use in order to print other people's films when I was in the business of making photographs. And it was, lack of a better word, my trade secret. And I wanted to share that with you guys. So, but what I'm teaching today is not a trade secret. It's something that someone in the photo lab knew. Not, most people didn't. Um, but the, the, <clears throat> the production manager would take these courses from Macbeth, who made desitometers, or Kodak, made film and paper and chemicals, and they would teach us this stuff. And although it wasn't for everyone in the lab, someone in the lab knew this stuff, and that's why I'm putting it on. It's not a trade secret. It's trade fundamentals okay and so it it is rather complicated but it's not that difficult if you're um, interested and you really need to know how to add and subtract multiply and divide as far as the math goes is you know so having said all that um I'll begin, okay? Now, in black and white, I started the lessons with how paper responds to exposure. And in black and white, you really only have one layer of emulsion. Now, you have two if you're using multi-grade, but that's still just black to white. It's two um, layers of black and white emulsion. In color, you've got three color emulsions. And they're made to be sensitive to red, green, and blue. And this is true for film as well as paper. So you've got three layers of emulsion to contend with. And you want to expose all three layers equally. You don't want to overexpose in one layer and underexpose another because that would cause an imbalance in color. Red, green, and blue are the three uh, largest spectrums of color that um, produce white light to, to the human visible spectrum. So when you shine, when you have daylight going through a prism and it bends it, you'll see a rainbow of color. The largest bands in that rainbow of color is red, green, and blue. So that's why Film and paper is made to be sensitive to red, green, or blue. And they do this with um, 
dyes that they put into the paper to filter out the opposite colors now when you buy um, film it's made to be exposed under a specific light daylight noontime daylight um, if you take that film and you go into an environment where you don't have that spectrum of light then you're gonna inevitably underexpose that layer of emulsion because there's not enough of that color to expose that layer of emulsion it's similar to taking daylight film and going into your kitchen at night where there's no daylight and you've only got the overhead lights on and you photograph people with color film what will happen is you'll get this really yellow red um, image that you can't color correct because there wasn't enough blue light in that environment to expose the blue sensitized layer of that color film and this is what we want to avoid normally okay now you can shoot like that and aesthetically it might <clears throat> add to a story because of the warm light and so forth but generally speaking um, we want to evenly expose all three layers of any color film well this is true also for color paper so when you print onto color paper in a dark room you want to expose all three layers evenly we do that we evaluate that by producing a nice gray patch so gray again is um, an equal amount of exposed and developed um, density on those three layers um, okay. so another thing that complicates color is that there's a slope concern now this is um, a good standard neg okay and I have to tell you that I just made these um, yesterday maybe the day before this is not a C print because I have shut down my color lab and I don't print um, color photographs anymore um, I now if I do any color at all, I'll do it on an inkjet. So this is an inkjet print, but it's a master image. It's got good grays, decent skin tone, and I dropped in a Macbeth color checker, which has a uh, six-step grayscale here. Okay. Um, just uh, an aside comment. I probably will no longer print color C prints from now on because I've printed color prints for many years and I've gone through many different processors, um, small process, tray processing, batch processing in a, in a, in a basket line back when we had five chemicals and <clears throat> and now it's reduced down to two chemicals and the processor I had <clears throat> had 55 gallons of developer um, three wash tanks you know I had a 80 inch wide processor as well as a 52 inch processor and and to produce superb C prints it was washed with plenty of water I had very low stain the whites were very good the blacks were excellent um, because of the washing um, they produced the most archival prints when I went and used smaller processes I did I couldn't get the stain I couldn't get the blacks partly because it wasn't as much developer when there's less developer the paper has to travel slower and um, you get less agitation because you still need the immersion time to be the same <clears throat> so five minutes dry to dry if it's only this <clears throat> much travel five inches has to travel like this well if it's across the street it's traveling like this 
and so you get a lot better agitation. So in, a, in any case, I'm, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to print color prints in my dark room because I know that I won't get as good um, agitation development. I won't get as good blacks or nearly the whites that I could get with a really good commercial made process. I happen to use the Hope processor. I've used many processes, but the Hope was my favorite anyway. So that's just an aside. So getting back to this, <clears throat> when you print this as your aim, you can go for a gray patch that on the reflection densitometer measures 75, 75, 75, or 80, 80, 80, 85, 85, 85, 85 depending on how dark you want this to be. But your middle, your middle grays are going to be reflecting um, when you shine red light into the print and, ref and it collects light reflecting off the print, it'll give you a reading of 75. Green, 75, blue, 75. It could be 75, 74, 72. It'll still look fairly gray. Okay. But when you print this to look like this, you need to give less exposure. And if you used 10 seconds for this exposure, you might use only two seconds in order to get this to be as light as that. In order to get this as dark as that, you'll need 20 seconds, 24 seconds, depending on the contrast of your master negative, okay? When you do that, ideally, it should remain gray. If you lighten this and it goes red, then your shadows will reproduce red when your midtones are gray. Likewise, when you print this down to gray, it should remain gray. If it's a perfectly exposed and processed color negative. Um, when we were making dye transfers and we made um, our balance, our, our master balance on dye transfers, we did the same thing. We would retain good neutrality up and down by balancing the dyes and the rinses which is but everything's um calibrated by your reproduction of a grayscale now when you buy film off the shelf and you run this test and you make all these grays in order to make this gray you might need to alter your filter pack and it'll be different than what it was required to make this great. That's your film slope. Okay. And every film has a different film slope. Um, I said in a previous video, the only negative that produced great up and down here was when I made my own negative onto inter negative film. That was what our software did to make a good negative from a transparency we would balance the grayscale and if it was balanced correctly then just by altering your exposure you can make every one of these patches gray that never happened the closest i got to that with on the shelf film was the old vps and today i would say maybe kodak's natural color is nc that that film is probably the best for this purpose but if you go to Fuji film, it's going to be different. And because you have different slopes, analyzing, knowing what to use for each negative that you're going to print in a dark room is complicated by that. Because if you print it, if you underexpose, it's going to be a different filter pack than if you're printing. You know, so the best thing to do is for you to make your standard neg on those films that you shoot. So if you're shooting Kodak film and Fuji film, you'll want to make a master neg, probably the same image with um, different films and maintain that balance in your darkroom, okay? So this is a master print. Presumably how you would do this is you take the negative and you just go into your darkroom 
and you do need a light level um, meter which I showed in the previous video so let's say a light level is 2.2 10 seconds and this took 30 yellow 30 magenta or 40 yellow 45 magenta whatever filtration you use that's your balance now you every time you print you make one and it will drift mainly because the paper ages um, slowly over time your your filters in the dark room fade a little bit um, the chemistry maybe the temperature is a little high so you instead of 10 seconds you may back off to 9.2 um, but every time you print you make a master and you process it along with everything else and then you ha you maintain it and that gives you a starting point at least for your master neg you know that if you take this master neg into the dark room you can print it and it'll look fairly like this and that's your master that's your standard so in uh, color it's even more important to have a standard neg than in uh, black and white okay okay now let's talk a little bit about filters um, nowadays we have color enlargers that um, have dichroic filters in there there's a cyan filter a yellow filter and a magenta filter and they're very uh, consistent in that if you go into 30 yellow it's going to be the same as the 30 yellow you used yesterday so that's good the construction of the enlargers are very good now back in the early 60s when I started printing we used CP filters, color printing filters, and they were these acetate filters that were cyan, yellow, or magenta, and you'd put it above the negative. And if you needed a little bit more yellow, you use a five. It didn't have uh, one yellow filters. They didn't have two yellow filters. Um, so a dichroic head is much better than using filters now there's also cc filters color correction filters and they're made not with acetate they're made with gelatin and gelatin is nice in that when the light passes through the gelatin it doesn't bend the light so much so cp filters you cannot use it under the lens because the image will be distorted basically the picture will begin to look foggy and out of focus but cc filters you can use uh, in under the lens and those um do come in in smaller increments so you can buy like a two and a half yellow and, and so forth and um, i've got cc filters here um, which i used for color correction and um, okay, I should show you that. You can see. Okay, so these are CC filters which I purchased and carried with me when I went on a sales call. Now, in the lab, I had these large ones, and it comes in blue, yellow, red cyan magenta and green this is 50 blue 40 30 20 seven and a half five two and a half so those are all blue and as you can see it gets lighter and lighter and lighter um cc filters are useful for filter burning and filter dodging so what i did here was i um, sandwich this in between glassine um, and I made a lith film with a clear window so it's taped together so that I could use it when I went to go over jobs with clients and we'd look at color together I would pull these out if the occasion rise and it was helpful many times the clients couldn't see because they're not used to using filters to look at <clears throat> they're colored images um, but anyway you know, I, I had it with me and like I said in the lab I had large ones now 
in color, we have opposites. Like black is the opposite of white. Um, blue is the opposite of yellow. Okay. And let's see, let me make sure you can see. <laughs> So, blue is the opposite of yellow. Just work with this here. And magenta is the opposite of green. When you combine yellow and magenta, this is 40 yellow and 40 magenta. When you combine yellow with magenta you get red so red is composed of yellow equal amounts of yellow and magenta when you combine green and blue you get cyan so therefore cyan is the opposite of red okay now if you combine 40 cell 40 yellow i mean 40 cyan and 40 red you'll get gray if you combine these, you, this is gray. Okay, so you neutralize the colors when you combine them with their opposite. So any number of these combinations, I mean, you can always have a print that is magenta blue or yellow green, right? So basic theory, um, that you have to know and keep in your in your head all the time is yellow is opposite of blue, magenta is opposite of green. Yellow and magenta makes red. Blue and green makes cyan. Okay? So again, you can see these. This is red. This is gray. This is cyan these become gray mm -hmm. okay now uh, back to me I've been thinking about doing this the last week and trying to organize it so that uh, it'll make sense and you can use this video lesson on YouTube as a reference because for some reason it's not there. It, it, no one talks about this. And so it would be really difficult to learn color correction if you don't have this under your belt, okay? And, it, it, and I've trained over 100 people in the darkroom and just a handful really ever learned color correction. A lot of them weren't interested in color correction. They just give you the print, you, say mine's 10 yellow and at 30 percent density and make another test and they would do it and they were very good at that but they weren't interested in um color correction per se and part of the reason is uh they couldn't see it they couldn't see the difference between blue and magenta or yellow and green they get confused and some of the employees were colorblind so they really couldn't see it they they wind up with a finished print that to them didn't look as good as the first test because they saw a color differently which is I should tell you a story about that later um, okay so anyway what you want to do if you're serious about learning color correction is to make a ring around um, a ring around is when you go around normal. So this is my normal. Okay. And this is what you would shoot for when you make a good balanced color print. But 
in order to make this print, you need to have the filter pack in the enlarger that you know will work. Now, I would suggest that you start with a filter pack that gives you a good amount of leeway in order to move. So you don't want to use something like five yellow. Because if you start with five yellow and your this particular neg needs to subtract ten yellow, you've only got five. So now you gotta add cyan. And then you throw everything off. So the cyan, if it is to be used, is locked in place. Don't move the cyan. Once you have it set on 20 cyan, leave it there. Um, when you start mixing cyan with yellow and magenta, you'll get what we in a trade called cyan error. It just doesn't um, equate, it doesn't work well. Unless you have a really good on easel analyzer and then you ignore what the filter head says. And But suffice to say, if you're working with own, uh, a lone magenta or yellow number, Go ahead and add cyan, but lock it in so that you're always around 30, 30 yellow, 30 magenta, 30 yellow, 45 magenta. Then you then you have plenty to add and plenty to subtract, okay? You'll need that in order to do your ring around, okay? So don't touch the cyan knob on your enlarger once you have it set. Um, I mean, you can... You can use cyan for this paper and this paper, not because it, it, your larger is repeatable. But don't go messing with it when you're color correcting. Okay. Um, okay. So ring around. The most important thing about a ring around is getting your density correct. I'm going to move the camera so you can see this. Mm -hmm. So I just made this ring. This is a series of prints where I, this is my normal, okay? So when I print them, these are just like four by five prints. Then I go ahead, let's say this is 10 seconds, okay? Then I make one at nine seconds. So I know that this got 10% less exposure by the way, I put the correction underneath it. So if I wanted to go back here, I need to add 11% to get back here, okay? So that's what you do. You you do a ring around where you know the deviation from normal. And then you write down what it takes to get back to normal. And this is your reference. So if I cut 35%, it's gonna be this light. I cut 50%, it's gonna be that light. If I add 15%, it's going to get this dark. In order to get back here, I have to subtract 13%. This is 25% additional exposure, so it's getting darker, and this gets darker. Keep in mind that this is a simulation. Um, these are inkjets, okay? Um, okay, so that's... And density is really important because... Um, as my father used to say, not everyone can see color, but everyone can see density. So the density's got to be right. Okay, now if I go up here, and I don't know how well you can see. normal and when I add yellow it starts to go blue in the filter head in the enlarger when I subtract yellow in the filter head 
it gets more yellow. Okay, so this is how printing color in a dark room works. When you subtract yellow, the print's going to be more yellow. When you add yellow, the print's going to be more blue. When you um, subtract magenta, the print's going to get more magenta. When you uh, minus magenta, the print's going to go more green. Okay, so let's I'll tilt this down so you can see just how green it gets. Okay, so this. This is minus uh, four magenta will bring you back to here. So I add a four magenta, add a eight, add a 12, add a 15. So you can see um, it gets pretty dramatic when you go beyond 10. This is more yellow. Uh, this is more yellow green okay so I have to back up I have to include this so here you're getting yellow here you're getting green here you're getting yellow green okay so when I get back to here from here to back here I have to add eight yellow and subtract eight magenta to get back there okay and on this side this is more blue this is more green so this is more cyan I mean more uh, I'm sorry this is <laughs> yes it is more cyan this is more cyan that's more red yeah so in order to get from here back to there I have to subtract eight yellow and subtract eight magenta to get back here so now you have a deviation confirmed by your enlarger and your processing so that if you have your test coming out looking like this, you know what it's going to take to get back there. So this is a ring around. Let's go up. So here, this down here is green. This up here is magenta, okay? And this being more blue, this is magenta blue. So in order to get back here, I have to subtract eight yellow and add eight magenta in order to get here. And in order to get from here to there, I have to add 12 magenta and it'll go back to here this is likewise okay so in order to get back to here i have to add eight yellow and add eight magenta because this is red to get back there so this is what is known as a ring around and i remember when i first um printed for my father and he showed me how the filters were opposite and so forth. I went in the dark room, I started doing this. And he asked me, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, well, I'm, I'm doing this test so that I can learn and, and see. And as I did it, he goes, oh, I see what you're doing. And then I taped it up like this. So I hadn't done this in like, I don't know, 40 years. But I did this. Um for the benefit of this lesson. Now, another thing is, it's very important that when you change your filter path, before you print it, you have to check the light level. Go back to two, if your light level is 2.2, go back to 2.2, because the light level will change when you alter your filter path. It gets, the light gets brighter or darker. So you have to readjust your light level and stay at 10 seconds. Now, when you do the density, test you don't need to because you're not changing the light level you're not changing the filter pack but when you do this you're changing the filter pack um, okay so you'll want to 
check your light level each time, which is kind of a pain in the butt if you're projecting this because you get to take the negative out of the enlarger, close the enlarger head so there's no light spill, put the light level meter down, readjust your f-stop and get 2.2, put the negative back in and then print it. <laughs> but that's how you do a ring around. All right now. Okay. Um, yeah, I think at this point I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, color blindness. <clears throat> We had a, I still have it somewhere, this book for testing color blindness. And if you look at it, there are these numbers that you see. And if you're not colorblind, you'll see all the numbers correctly. And um, if you're colorblind, you'll see different numbers. And there are like squiggly lines and so forth. You're supposed to take your finger and follow the squiggly line and Interestingly enough, there's one page there where it's just a bunch of scattered colors. And if you're colorblind, you'll see a line. And if you're not colorblind, you won't see that. You'll just see all these different colors. So the question is raised is who's, are you colorblind? Is, you know, or are they colorblind? Because they can see colors you can't. I had a, um, one client come in with an eight by 10 print and a negative. And he says, I, I want you to print this. And he says, I know that this print, this eight by 10 print doesn't look good to you, but to me, it's perfect. And every time I bring this negative to someone and they, I get it back, it's always this disappointment because they change the color. I don't want you to change the color. I want it to look, and the print looked cyan blue, <clears throat> very cyan blue. And I would never would have printed it like that if he didn't say anything, because obviously it was off balance. Well, I said, well, don't you think the contrast will, I mean, if I darken the sky here and, and oh yeah, you can do that, he says, do it, do it, but just the color. I, I, so I made him a 16 by 20 and I matched it to the best of my ability to what he gave me. And I, um, gave it more drama it was a it was a uh a sunset picture i remember the sun was it wasn't quite setting but it was coming through the clouds and so it was the ocean and the sky and and it was really cyan green and i just matched it and, but that, but i made it more dramatic by darkening certain areas and lightening certain areas and he just he was just in love with the picture he was so happy to get it he paid for it and he left and i thought in that case, I was blind, right? So even if you're colorblind, there's no reason why you can't make a print that you like. And who cares about what, what anyone else sees? Just make the print that you, because this is gonna be on your wall, you're gonna see it every day. You wanna feel good about it. You want the, the right feeling when you look at the print um, that you're hanging up. Okay, so just that much on colorblindness. Now, the densitometer. The densitometer is crucial when it comes to color printing and color correction. Um, I would say um, it's well worth it for any color printer to get a densitometer because they're so. I mean, I paid five thousand dollars for each densitometer that I purchased, but now you can get them for like a hundred, two hundred dollars. Um, so a color densitometer is is um, essential if you want to print color in a dark room. Uh, okay, I'm going to show you how to use a transmission densitometer. Okay, and you'll have to. Um, you, have, you remember that this is, I don't have a negative of this because I um, did this on the inkjet, but 
assuming I do have a negative of this, I'm going to be measuring this on a transition densitometer, okay? And um, for all intents and purposes, let's say this is, I use 30 yellow, 30 magenta, light level equals 2.20, and I use 10 seconds. So, 30, 30, 2.2, 10, okay? And that's what made this print. Okay, now that's going to be my um, starting point. As I analyze an unknown neg, I will come up with a filter pack and exposure for this neg compared to this neg. And since this made this, this new filter pack and exposure is going to make something that approaches this. That's the idea behind using a densitometer, okay? So let's do that. So, you probably can't read it, but it says T for transmission, red, green, blue. So, it gives you three measurements at one time. So, let's say this is that negative. This happens to be a um, just the Macbeth color checker with my grayscale and but this is a big effects color checker here. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Okay. So this is one of my internet masters I made years ago. And if I measure, I'm going to measure the base, okay? So if I measure the base, I get these three readings type and I'll write it down here. So this is the master. Okay. R G B. This happens to be the base, okay? I'm getting 0.41, 0 0.70, and 1.36. Okay, that's the, the reading of the master neg. Now, if I take an unknown neg, such as this, and I measure the base, which is just the orange part of the film, I get unknown okay because we haven't printed this yet and we're coming up with a, a filter pack to print this unknown name R G B this is 0 0.32 0 0.67 0 0.87 okay so the first thing we want to do is get an average of the three and you simply add these together and divide it by three okay so the math is not terribly hard um you can do this with a calculator 41 plus 70 plus 136 divided by three and we get a two point eight two that's how dense the negative is. So don't forget, what's happening is a red filter is going through the film, collecting how much red light is passing through. It gives, it's being stopped by 0.41. The green filter is being stopped 
Okay, if all the green light was going through, it would measure zero. But it's being stopped by two and one third stop because 0 0.3 equals one stop. So the green light's being stopped and the, and the blue light's being stopped. So that means this must be very yellow, right? Which it is. That's why the blue light has such a high reading because yellow is the opposite of blue. Well, you average the three and you have an overall density of 82. This one, if we do this math, 32 plus 67 plus 87 divided by three, you get 0.62. Okay? So the master is denser than this unknown name. That means this is going to require less exposure. So this just gives me my density. So 0.82 minus 0 0.62 is 0 0.20. 0 0.20, right? So that's two two thirds of a stop. By the way, it would be really helpful if you watched my previous lessons on the standard NAIC for black and white. Which when I did, I wasn't I wasn't planning to do this one on color, but and I have shown you this. Let's see, if this is here. Ah, I just turned. And in that video, I show you this. And I suggested you write it down. So, this is just, um, if the density reading on your unknown egg is higher than the standard egg, this is what you do. If it's higher by 0.3, then you add 100%. You double your time, you double your exposure. If the density reading is lower than the standard egg, that means it's thinner. You're going to have to use less exposure. So if it's thinner by 0.3, you cut 50%. Cut your time in half. That's one stop. Okay. Well, in this case, okay, this is lower by 0.20 lower by two so you cut 37 percent so for this unknown egg just talking about the density you're gonna minus 37 percent okay that's from that chart that's the easiest way to, to deal with these numbers because um, it's not going to fall exactly 0 0.6 or 0 0.3. Uh, so anyway, that's why I made that chart. So, again, to recap, the unknown neg is not as dense as the master. So, obviously, it's going to take less exposure. How much less? 37%. Okay, now let's look at the color. I remember <laughs> taking a class from Kodak when I was young in my 20s and they were explaining this and they made it really complicated. They had this chart. And so I'm going to try to make it real simple. <laughs> and, you know, my father sent me this class at Kodak and I came back thinking, this is crazy. This is the way they explained it was so convoluted. So I'm going to try to make it more clear. Okay. Now, it turns out that the red reading is always the lowest. Uh, because color negatives are red, and red lights allowed to penetrate through color negative film, so your 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 red reading is always the lowest. Okay, so let's compare 
the blue with the red and the green with the blue and the green with the red so 136 okay, this is your blue reading 1.36 minus 0.41 equals nine five okay that's this and seven this is green point seven minus point four one equals point two nine this is your yellow and this is your magenta that means that there's more yellow in the negative which blocks the blue light it's how much more yellow over three stops point three being one stop okay so this is point nine five and this is almost one stop more magenta okay um, than well <laughs> the there's more magenta than red um, because the green light is being prevented from getting through um, that film and so you get a higher reading of green than red okay how much more 95 and 29 that's the base okay this is the base of the film Because every film has base, okay? And the reason I'm using base will make sense to you later, okay? But obviously, you want to use gray. The gray is better to use than the base. The base is unexposed film, right? But the reason I'm using base will make sense to you later. Okay? Now, when we compare it with the unknown, this is what we get. The blue is 0.87 minus 0.32 oh, my daughter's calling me I should have to wait <laughs> I'm on a roll here okay so this gives you 0.55 right 87 minus 32 so now you get five yellow and then the green 0.67 minus 0.325 okay now you can put this on a spreadsheet I mean you just type this in and you load it on Excel you just type in the unknown you know pop up you know, which is basically, well, that's a lot easier. But it's important that you understand, so, with the math behind all this. What that means now is the unknown neg, Cass is up and he's hungry. I wanted to finish this lesson, but anyway, I might have to stop and take the lunch. Um, so this, what this means is you've got a difference of 40 yellow here, okay? This to this, 95, 55, 95, 40 yellow. This you got a difference of 29.32. You got a difference of six magenta. Okay, this is in the opposite direction. So this, you have to add 40 yellow and minus six magenta compared to the master. Does that make sense? 
I'll probably stop here and continue with the, I have to press the video again. But anyway, does that make sense? Uh, feel free to back up the video and watch it again. Now, this is why, this is why I use the base. This is what Kodak didn't do in their lesson. That made it very difficult to understand what they were doing. So everything to me is common sense. It makes sense to use common sense. You should be able to see this being the master and this being the unknown gives you a I'm going to turn this this way so you can see. Yeah. So this is the base of the master. Now, let me get my filters, okay? I'm going to grab a 40 yellow. This is a 40 yellow, okay? So this negative is going to require 40 yellow more. Now it begins to look like this, right? And it's going to need less magenta, which means I'm going to grab a five green. Now, according to the densitometer, this film base is closer to that now. So, if we started with 30 yellow and 30 magenta, we're going to go to 70 yellow we're going to add 40 to that. Instead of 30, we're going to go to 24 magenta. All right? We're still going to use 2.2. 10 seconds is going to become 6.3 minus 37%, right? Is that right? No. 10 minus 37%, 6.3 seconds. And that's how you use a densitometer to come up with a starting filter pack. Now that would ensure that the black here, this is going to print close to the black that you have in your um, master print. Obviously, you want to use gray. Okay. The reason why I use the base is so that you can see what the densitometer is doing. I'm going to have to stop here, and I'll continue after I take the kids to lunch, or maybe tomorrow.